So I would like to thank the organizers for the privilege to say a few words here. Uh, it's a, a little embarrassing to be the first speaker because my overlap with the main topic of this program is actually relatively small. Of course, I've worked on random systems with quench disorder and so on during various periods of my professional life, but not, not very recently. So I'm going to talk about problems that actually show very little randomness. I hope that's okay. And um, well, so let's start. I will try to give a survey of problems in quantum dynamics where I believe some reasonably substantial progress has been made in recent years, but uh, along the way we will emphasize how little we actually understand. So the problem of dynamics in quantum theory, you know, there are many problems that we don't understand at all, and we will come to that. Now before confessing ignorance, let's uh, give a little table of contents. I will start with a general introduction. In particular, I would like to describe various typical examples of dynamical phenomena in quantum theory, where we have uh, learned to understand something in recent years. And uh, then I would like to illustrate these phenomena in terms of very simple models. And these, sim these models are so simple that you will immediately see that uh, you know, most of the real questions are still open. OK, so that, that's uh, point two. And then, if ti then perhaps my time will be over. If not, I will look at one specific example in a little more detail and state a few technical results and maybe also make a few remarks about how these results are proven. And that will be about Hamiltonian and quantum friction. I could do something else, but for example, the Brownian motion was already uh, done by Antti Kupjainen. So I thought this might be a nice compliment. So here is a list of people who have worked with me in recent years. There were senior collaborators, <laughs> in particular some of the material I will briefly talk about at the beginning uh, is contained in work with uh, Volker Bach and Israel Michael Siegel. I would say Siegel certainly has been a very important collaborator over the past 20 years. But then uh, various other people, for example, Wojciech de Ruck has been important. And most recently, Gang Zhou has been a very, very wonderful collaborator. He's an excellent mathematician. However, as I, for example, emphasized in my goodbye lecture at ETH Zurich, I think the essence of my professional life was the work with students. And so I had the privilege to have some very good students, and some of them were involved in this work. And here is a list. Of course, some of these students are now professors, but uh, most of them have not, you know, it's not very long ago that uh, I was still in touch with them. All right. So uh, I already mentioned the goal. The goal of this. Uh, Lecture is to discuss examples of some typical dynamical phenomena in quantum theory. And uh, as I mentioned, quench disorder and localization will be, I think, covered in many other lectures. So I will certainly skip that, although I still find it a very interesting topic. So here is the beginning of my introduction. All right, so I start with the quantum optics of atoms and molecules. That is the work I have mostly carried out with Bach and Siegel and also with Alessandro Pizzo. And the problem that one would like to understand is the dynamics of atoms and molecules when they interact with the quantized radiation field. Uh, there has been you know, a lot of work extending over several decades about Schrödinger operators trying to understand binding, resonances, scattering, and so on in atomic physics. 
but the atoms were always totally dark because they were not permitted to interact with the electromagnetic field. And some 20 years ago, we decided that uh, this should change, and we started a program to try to incorporate the electromagnetic field, and that changes many aspects of atomic and molecular physics. In particular, you cannot use any simple perturbation theory methods anymore. You always have to uh, take refuge in some uh, method of multi-scale perturbation theory, or <coughs> as we might want to call it, spectral renormalization group methods. This would be a lecture in itself, I think not an uninteresting one, but I would not like to go into details unless, of course, somebody specifically wants me to talk about that. So that's the first example. Uh, if, you, if it's okay with you, uh, I occasionally use the blackboard to make a few additional remarks. You see, when you think of an atom, and let's, and I think the re recent progress has been to treat atoms that are not static, not infinitely heavy, then you, you're dealing with a translation invariant system. And what you're interested in, for example, if you do spectral theory, is the joint energy momentum spectrum of the system. So here I plot the modulus of the momentum P and vertically the energy, and then a the center of mass energy of an atom before it is coupled to the radiation field is just a parabola. We look at non-relativistic matter. Then it may have internally excited states. So there are these parabola that describe excited uh, states of the atom. And now when we couple the system to the electromagnetic field, uh, there is a continuum superimposed which consists of this uh, blue shaded region. The blue shaded region is the joint energy momentum spectrum of the total system before the interactions between the electromagnetic field and the atom are turned on. Now let's turn them on. I hope there is another color. Then of course there are radiative corrections to all these energies. The system has unfortunately little symmetry it is not invariant on the Galilei nor on the Poincaré, so you don't quite know how uh, the dispersion laws of the atom look like after the interactions have been turn on, turned on. But the idea is to show that there is still, for every fixed momentum, there is a fixed ground state or a one-particle state corresponding to that momentum. What happens to the up? the excited state states, they all turn into resonances. And so one of the problems we were interested in is to compute, for example, the lifetime of these resonances, the decay modes, to understand how they decay. We want to understand why there are these one-particle ground states. We would like to understand how the excited states eventually relax towards the ground state all these are problems about which we have made a lot of progress. For example, I give you a typical result. It can now be shown that these dispersion curves are real analytic as functions of the momentum. This is a little surprising because it is a, per a perturbation problem where there are no gaps. So it's not analytic perturbation theory that can be used. Nevertheless, analyticity is preserved. That is not totally easy to show. Uh, you know, there are lots of old topics in atomic and molecular physics that we are used to and we have learned them in school, in our courses, but if you ask what is understood about them, then it tends to be very little. One such story is the Bohr frequency condition. You know that if an atom decays from an excited state to a lower lying state, it emits a photon whose frequency is given by the energy difference between h bar, uh, divided by h bar. And so that's the Bohr frequency condition. Why is that true? Well, in perturbation theory, it comes out reasonably simply, but non-perturbatively, this has been 
a big problem and only a few years ago we finally started to understand how such a thing is proven in a mathematically rigorous fashion. So, um, well, there are many other remarks I could make about this particular example, <coughs> but I think we should maybe move on to the next example. That is about ionization of atoms. This is something Joel used to be interested in too, right? You have several papers on ionization. So what we were interested in is the question, what happens if you send a laser pulse to an atom? This was a problem that was first analyzed with some precision by Kostrykin and Schrader. And, but they didn't do the, the details of how the ionization process works. For example, you can ask, how long do you have to wait until the atom is ionized, ionizi ionization times? There were many papers in the literature wi that were totally confused because they disagreed with the experiments. And so finally, I think we understood how to compute such a thing. We also did the geometry of the ionization. We could predict in which direction electrons are emitted and so on if you are given the shape of the laser pulse. This was something I did with uh, Benjamin Schlein, who will be here after the new year, I guess, and uh, Alessandro Pizzo. What is interesting about this problem is that the electromagnetic field that describes the laser pulse is big, and so the problem is sort of intrinsically non-perturbative. And only because part of the problem can be solved exactly we were able to say something interesting about it. The problem I will try to describe in a little more detail today is the problem of Cherenkov radiation. And I can immediately tell you what this problem is about. Uh, looking at this picture here, you see when you couple the atom to uh, the radiation field, then it turns out that at some critical velocity, let's call it V star, the one particle state dives into the continuum. What is this critical velocity? That's the velocity of light. So when the atom is as fast as light, uh, then the one particle states dissolve. Now how could such a thing happen? Well, of course, in a model, it can happen if you describe the atom non-relativistically, then it can have an arbitrarily large speed. But one might say this is unphysical. However, if you let a charged particle travel through an optically dense medium, water, for example, at the speed that is larger than the speed of light in the medium, then it emits a radiation, which is called Cherenkov radiation, and it comes from... It's exactly the radiation that happens when these one-particle states decay. They decay until the speed of the particle has dropped to uh, the speed of light or below. And then it travels ballistically. That's the phenomenon of Cherenkov radiation. I will discuss it a little later in a little more detail. And we can consider this problem quantum mechanically and also in a limiting regime in the so-called mean field limit. And in fact, in the mean field limit, the information we get about this phenomenon is quite precise and uh, you can do some nice mathematics. It is connected to nonlinear Hamiltonian evolution equations. Another problem that has been studied by a variety of people and with quite a lot of success in recent years is the problem of quantum statistical mechanics, in particular the typical problems that people were considering is to have a small system. The small system is, for example, a heat engine, and it is coupled to uh, uh, several uh, heat baths, thermal reservoirs, and you want to know what happens. If there is just one thermal reservoir and you couple a small system to it, you would expect that the total system approaches an equilibrium state 
at the temperature of the reservoir. This is a typical result that is, has been understood uh, in recent times. Uh, more interesting are problems where you have several reservoirs and where you try to show that the system approaches a steady state or perhaps a time periodic state. These are results that play an important role when you try to derive the fundamental laws of thermodynamics from quantum <coughs> statistical mechanics. And that's another you know, area in quantum theory where dynamical phenomena appear and where there has been a lot of progress in recent years. A topic that Antti Kupjainen has already covered in his lecture uh, and that I also have worked on actually is quantum Brownian motion. So you couple a particle that is either charged or carries an electric dipole moment to black body radiation at some temperature, T positive, and you ask how does the motion of the particle look like? Well, this is a problem that goes back more than 100 years. We would all expect that what you will see at large times is a Brownian motion process. Now, if you describe the particle quantum mechanically, it's not quite Brownian motion because this is a process where the momentum of the particle always remains finite. In fact, the kinetic energy of the particle satisfies an equipartition theorem. I, its average will be roughly equal to 3 over 2 times k times t. That's the equipartition theorem. However, the position of the particle uh, exhibits a diffusive motion. And that is something that we have learned to understand at least in very simple models, the models are a little bit too, perhaps a little too naive uh, to be completely convincing. However, we don't have to do any kind of strange limits about the black body ra radiation and so on. It's, it's an honest result. All right, the, uh, there is one further, I think, very central problem in quantum dynamics, and that is to understand what happens when you do an experiment in quantum mechanics, when you measure a certain physical quantity. So let's suppose we represent physical quantities of a quantum system by uh, self-adjoint operators, and we would like to measure such a quantity. Then there is a dogma which goes back to the Copenhagen interpretation that tells us that when you have completed the, the measurement of the quantity successfully, the initial state of the system has uh, become an incoherent superposition, a density matrix, and this density matrix will be a superposition of projections, and these projections are eigenprojections of the quantity that you have measured. So the quantity I measure is called A. It's an operator representing a physical quantity. Now this is strange, you know. This is really strange because this psi could be a pure state. In fact, we have a pretty good theory that tells us how to prepare quantum systems in certain pure states. That would be another interesting topic about quantum dynamics that I could talk about. So let's suppose we have prepared the system in a certain pure state, and then we measure a physical quantity A. And then the Copenhagen mumbo jumbo tells us that after the measurement, we get the density matrix, a mixture. So how can that be? This is a problem in quantum dynamics, and I believe there has been some interesting progress about it. Uh, during the past few years, I have given a talk about it at Rutgers last week. Probably nobody quite understood it, but uh, I, uh, I think I understand what I'm talking <laughs> about. So I will probably talk about this again here at some point in the future, but for today it's a little bit too long to go into this particular subject.
Uh, of course, one could have talked about <coughs> other things, for example, about structural aspects of quantum theory. <coughs> you know, quantum statistics has been something very interesting, or the quantum Hall effect, things like that. I've been working on these things on and off over many years, but uh, this is maybe for another occasion. I would like to introduce some simple models to illustrate, aha, maybe before I do that, let me emphasize the following thing. You know, although I believe we have really made some progress in understanding certain, at least at the qualitative level, certain types of dynamical phenomena in quantum theory, such as Brownian motion, such as friction, such as localization phenomena, and so on and so forth. However, we always have to describe the thermal baths, the reservoirs, the wave media to which our small systems are coupled in terms of very, very simple systems, basically non-interacting ideal gases, either of photons or of phonons or of atoms and so on. That, of course, is disappointing. If we wanted to understand interacting thermal reservoirs and summarize the results that we have, it's, not, it's basically nothing. We understand something about phases and phase transitions in big systems, quantum systems, but we understand very little about their dynamical properties, unfortunately. So that's a big topic of research that should be addressed by courageous young people. So let's now look at some simple models, which are simple enough that we can say something about uh, what happens. So the small system that I will consider will always be, for at least for this talk, an atom or an ion. It can move the configuration space for which it moves is either Euclidean free space or a lattice. The atom may have internal states. These, uh, for simplicity, I say it has just a finite number of possible internal states. The state space is this uh, Cn. So the total space of uh, Hilbert space of pure states of the system is an L2 over the configuration space tensored with the Cn that describes the internal states. Time evolution of the system before it is coupled to an environment is generated by a Hamiltonian of the form minus Laplacian over 2m, that's kinetic energy, plus potential energy, a V of x. x is denotes the position of the atom, and it acts in a trivial way on the internal states, and then 1 tends at omega. Omega is simply a diagonal m by m matrix that uh, tells us what the energy of the excited states of the atom are. Now we couple the particle to an environment, and for the purposes of this lecture, the environment could either be the electric quantized electromagnetic field, or for example a Bose gas. I will look at Bose gases because people are less familiar with that, so it may be a little more interesting to look at the Bose gas. I will have to describe the Bose gas in some limiting regime. It will usually be the regime where the Bose gas is very dense but extremely weakly interacting. This is a limit that was considered by Bogolyubov many years ago. Uh, at low enough temperature, such a system exhibits Bose-Einstein condensation. B star x and Bx are creation and annihilation operators for the quanta of the sound waves in the Bose gas, or if you think of the electromagnetic field, they would be creation and annihilation operators for photons. They satisfy the canonical commutation relations, so two B stars or two Bs commute, while the commutator of Bx with B star y is a delta function. They act on a Hilbert, these operators are you know, operator value distributions acting on a certain Hilbert space, and the Hilbert space I will choose for the purposes of this lecture is the representation space for these canonical commutation relations appropriate to describe a system at some temperature, capital T, that is greater or equal to zero. When T equals zero, the state space is the familiar Fox space that you all know, 
for P positive, it is a little more complicated. It can be characterized in terms of a state that satisfies the Kuber-Martin-Schwinger boundary condition. The Hamiltonian of a Bose gas in the bogle yubov limit, or also of the electromagnetic field, is simply quadratic in creation and annihilation operators, so it's a form integral dk, d star k, omega k, dk. Omega k is the frequency of a mode of wave vector k, and uh, these frequencies look as follows. Um, I guess probably on the next slide. Yes. So, for an interacting Bose gas, the frequency of a mode of wave vector k grows linearly in the modulus of k with a coefficient that is the speed of sound in the Bose gas. If the Bose gas is an ideal non-interacting gas, it, uh, the dispersion law is quadratic in k. All right, and now we couple the atom to the Bose gas. <coughs> so the state space will be the tensor product. The unperturbed Hamiltonian will be the sum of the atomic Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian of the Bose gas. And now we add an interaction term. For simplicity in this lecture, my interaction is going to be chosen to be a very simple, uh, have a very simple form. I, w of capital, capital X is the position of the atom. Little x is the position of a mode in the Bose gas. And W is some two-body potential. And the interaction Hamiltonian is an integral of over all of uh, space of this two-body potential, and then you excite a mode in the Bose gas and de-excite the atom, or you excite the atom and absorb a quantum of the Bose gas. So it's linear in B and B star. So the C minus and the C plus are raising and lowering operators for the internal states of the atom. Total Hamiltonian is then simply the sum of H naught plus lambda times HI. Lambda will typically be a, co uh, a constant that is proportional to the square root of the density of the Bose gas. All right. So that's now uh, the system. The total Hamiltonian will be H naught plus lambda HI. And now we want to understand what kind of dynamics is Hamiltonian generates. Now, in general, this is already too difficult and we cannot say very much. However, there are limiting regimes where we understand quite a bit. And so the first limiting, oops, the first limiting regime is the following. You take uh, this particle, this atom, couple it to the Bose gas or to the radiation field, but you set the temperature of the system to zero. And you assume that the coupling constant lambda is small. This is a regime that is fairly well understood. It becomes even better understood if you make the mass of the atom to become very heavy so that it becomes static. Then it's, in fact, a very simple model. It's called the spin generalized spin boson model. But I should emphasize, you don't have to take the mass to infinity. We under this is a regime we understand in much detail. It's the regime for which we can do the analysis of resonances and of, uh, in fact, of scattering phenomena and so on. All right. And this would be, I suppose, a lecture in itself. <coughs> the second regime that is fairly well understood is the kinetic regime. You make the mass of the atom to be pretty he heavy for small coupling lambda. And the temperature can now be positive, And you assume that the particle has internal several internal states. All right. This is a regime which, for example, Roland Bauerschmidt here present has studied in his master thesis at ETH. So if you want to under, uh, know more about it, you can ask Roland, right? And then there is another regime that is maybe even better understood. That's the mean field regime. You make the atom very heavy, and also the, the external potential acting on the atom 
to be very strong, and you choose lambda to be very large. In fact, lambda squared will be proportional to the density of the Bose gas, and you make this density very, very large. In fact, it turns out this density plays the role of the inverse Planck constant. So when you let rho become very large, this corresponds to taking Planck's constant to zero, so you approach a classical regime. And in fact, in this so-called mean field regime, the dynamics of the coupled system becomes Hamiltonian dynamics on an infinite dimensional phase space. And that's the example I will try to discuss in a little more detail. Now, I can offer you a few heuristic ideas about how one analyzes a model of this type in uh, one of these limiting regimes. Okay, so let's look at the kinetic regime. Uh, let's suppose that T bar denotes the mean time that uh, passes between two collisions of the atom with a mode of the Bose gas. Well, this mean time, of course, will become very large when the interaction between the atom and the Bose gas is very weak. In fact, it is expected to, well, it, this is just, you know, second order perturbation theory. This mean time is proportional to the inverse square of the coupling constant lambda. Let V bar denote the mean speed of the atom as it travels through the Bose gas. Well, this mean speed is, a, is proportional. I now specifically assume that the atom travels on a lattice. The configuration space is a simple cubic lattice. That simplifies things because then the atom can never become extremely fast. And then, in fact, if you specify the mass of the atom to be proportional to 1 over lambda squared, the mean speed is of the order of lambda squared. So for lambda small, the mean speed is pretty small. Now, what one of the quantities we are interested in, and you heard this in the talk of Antti Kupjainen, is you would like to understand the average of the position of the atom at time t minus in e its initial uh, position squared in a state that describes thermal equilibrium for the Bose gas and some localized initial state for the atom. So how do we compute that? We can use the fundamental theorem of calculus. X, the average of x t minus x naught squared is given by a double integral over a time t1 from 0 to t and the time t2 from 0 to t, x dot t1 dot x dot t2, averaged in the state of the system. Well, from what I have said, this, uh, you can expect that this average is very small or nearly zero once the difference of time t1 and time t2 is large as compared to the average time between two collisions. Why? Because the collisions of the atom with modes of the Bose gas will decorrelate the directions and also the magnitudes of the speed of the atom. So this correlation is expected to become small. If that were the case, we can do the double integral. We find it goes like v bar squared. This is, after all, the average of the square of a velocity. So it goes like v bar squared times this uh, constant times t bar. That comes from the integration over t1 minus t2 times t, which comes from the integration of over t1 plus t2. All right? And well, this apparently grows linearly in time t. So apparently this atom exhibits a diffusive motion. And the diffusion constant is expected to go like a constant times order lambda squared. The constant depends on temperature and will blow up when the temperature goes to zero. Now we have heard something about how such a thing is proven. The real hard work has to go into understanding these velocity-velocity correlations and to understand that they decay in the difference variable t1 minus t2, and that is not an easy matter. It requires understanding of, quant of Lindblad dynamics and then of an expansion around Lindblad dynamics. All 
right? So here, is a, uh, here are a few heuristic remarks about the mean field regime. So I recall the mean field regime is a regime where the atom becomes very heavy. The force is acting on the atom become very strong so that something happens still. And the Bose gas is very weakly intera interacting but very dense. The density row, the mean density row of the Bose gas is supposed to become extremely large. In this limit, it is reasonable to introduce new creation and annihilation operators to exhibit the semi-classical nature of the problem. So I uh, said the original creation or annihilation operator equal to square root of rho times a new rescaled creation or annihilation operator. The rescaled operator satisfy commutation relations where the commutator of B and B star is proportional to rho inverse. And I already mentioned to you that rho inverse plays the role of Planck's constant H bar. So you will see that when rho becomes large, that means that we approach a classical regime. If we express the original Hamiltonian in terms of the operators B star rho and B rho, and take into account that the mass of the particle is rescaled and the potential too, the Hamiltonian will have a factor of rho in front of all terms and then inside the brackets there, are there. there is what there is. I don't have to read this formula to you, you see it. So if I plug this Hamiltonian into the original Schrödinger equation and divide both sides by rho, the Schrödinger equation looks like rho inverse time derivative of the state functional psi sub t equals to the Hamiltonian, which is now a function of rho or rho inverse applied to psi of t. Since rho inverse plays the role of h bar, this Schrödinger equation apparently has the right form to consider the semi-classical limit as h bar tends to zero. All right. And what happens in this limit? Well, I mean, that's not a totally easy matter. It has become a very popular. This problem has been made popular originally by Klaus Hepp, who was my thesis advisor in the mid-70s. Then uh, it sort of went dormant. But then in 98, when I was visiting Princeton, I ran into Yao. And I was worried about questions like that. And I think Yao decided maybe it was worth becoming a little active in this direction. And so in the meantime, there are many pap new papers about understanding with mathematical precision how the mean field limit is approached. And in fact, in the model example at hand, what happens in the mean field limit is that the equations of motion for the atom become classical Hamiltonian equations of motion. M naught x dot equals momentum p, p dot equals minus gradient of the external potential, minus the gradient of the forces that are exerted on the atom by the modes of the Bose gas. This term is linear in the state, in the wave field that describes the state of the Bose gas in the mean field limit it is denoted by beta t. So beta is sort of the classical limit of a creation or annihilation operator. And then the equations of motion of this wave field beta that describes the state of the Bose gas looks as follows. I times the time derivative of beta is omega convolved with beta. Omega is the dispersion law of uh, sound waves in the Bose gas, plus W at the argument xt minus x. Capital X sub t is the position of the particle at time t. And uh, so that's a system of you know, coupled nonlinear equations. And you want to study the solutions and in particular understand qualitative behavior of the solution at large times. And these are problems I have studied mostly with Gang Zhou during the past uh, three, four years. So this is a good starting point for studying 
the phenomenon of Cherenko radiation, which for people who still remember the times of atomic energy was an important phenomenon in a nuclear reactor. All right. So, I think I still have 10 minutes, right? Is that correct? So, if, if you like, I, I can now give you a few details about the mathematics involved in studying uh, these Hamiltonian evolution equations uh, that describe Cherenkov radiation in the mean field limit. I could do any other example if you like, but this, this one I have prepared on my slides. The other ones I would have to do on the blackboard. So if, since nobody expresses an opinion, I will just go on with, my, with what I have prepared. All right, so I uh, will describe a mechanism that uh, is at work when you want to understand Hamiltonian friction. You see, friction forces are, well, I will comment on that. So uh, the mechanism goes as follows. The bracer particle, this atom that moves through the Bose gas, will be shown to decelerate, become slower, but because it emits Cherenkov radiation of sound waves into the Bose gas, until the speed of this atom has dropped to a value smaller than or equal to the speed of sound in the Bose gas. So translated to electromagnetism, we study a charged particle moving through an optically dense medium at an initial speed larger than the speed of light, and then it will be decelerated by the emission of electromagnetic radiation until its speed has dropped to a value equal to the speed of light or below. So these are totally analogous phenomena. The Cherenkov radiation in a Bose gas was not studied much. In the literature, I think we were among the first who studied it, and, and uh, one of our papers immediately attracted a little attention by the cold atoms people. All right, so this is what I want to uh, discuss. If you prefer the kinetic limit over the mean field limit, then this was a problem addressed in this master thesis of Bauerschmidt. All right, so let's go on. I now start with part two, and that is Hamiltonian friction. Mechanics and in fact, dynamics started in antiquity. So, for example, Aristotle was very interested in studying dynamics. And he thought that, well, he, he, here is a quote, a moving body will come to rest as soon as the force pushing it no longer acts on it in the manner necessary for its propulsion. So Aristotle thought that the speed of a moving body was proportional to the force you apply to it. And when the force stops, it will slow down and come to rest. Well, you know, this was not such a bad idea. That's what we see in daily life. It turned out it was not a good starting point to develop a mathematical theory of mechanics. But from a purely phenomenological point of view, it was not a bad idea. All right. And so, the problem I want to discuss next is how we understand Aristot Aristotle's intuition from a modern point of view, from the point of view of Hamiltonian mechanics. So here is a little introduction to part two. So the general theme I'm addressing here is to pass from fundamental to effective dynamics. We believe that Hamiltonian or celestial mechanics is a fundamental description of the phenomena in the sky, or the Schrödinger equation is a fundamental description of quantum mechanical systems. However, often the fundamental description of dynamical phenomena is too difficult to understand, so we would like to pass to an effective description of these phenomena. For example, we would like to have a dissipative type of dynamics that involves also friction and diffusion and Brownian motion, or rather than studying the Schrödinger equation, we would like to study a quantum mechanical stochastic process with a limb blood generator, and we would like to understand how to pass from the fundamental description to the effective description. And 
I give you an example of where this can be done. All right. And now I have recapitulated the def definition of the model, but given that the time is late, I mean, you just heard it, it's really a particle, an atom, say, coupled to a Bose gas in the mean field limit. That's what I want to study. I have derived this, uh, you know, dispersion law that grows linearly in the modulus of K if you have interactions in the Bose gas, but uh, I won't go through this derivation. Uh, but now discuss what we understand about this model. Let's first consider the model to be quantum mechanical. So I look at the, an atom, possibly with internal states, as explained at the beginning, coupled to the sound waves of a Bose gas. Then the joint energy momentum spectrum is this blue shaded region, as indicated also on the blackboard. And you see that above the speed of sound, the one particle, the unperturbed one particle states of, or the energy of the unperturbed one particle states dives into the continuum. It is now expected that when we turn on interactions between the atom and the sound waves in the Bose gas, these unperturbed one particle states that correspond to this uh, parab parabola will become resonances and that they will decay by emission of sound waves until they reach a speed down below here where the one particle states turn out to be stable even after the coupling to the Bose gas has been turned on. All right. So the question is how much do we understand? Well, we have some understanding of the spectral theory. We have some understanding that the unperturbed uh, one particle states that correspond to energies embedded in the continuum become unstable. This can be proven by, uh, with the help of a, just a virial theorem, actually. But this is a virial theorem which is uh, surprisingly complicated. It is a result that I worked out with uh, De Rook and Pizzo. And it is a multi-scale virial theorem. It's one of the more complicated papers that I have been involved with in my life. And it probably means that we haven't quite understood the problem in an in, in a, in efficient way. In any event, we can show that under various assumptions that I'm not going to describe in any detail, one particle states corresponding to one particle energies embedded in the, in the continuum become unstable. How they decay precisely, namely the dynamics of the decay at the level of the full quantum dynamics is not well understood at all. It's a problem in scattering theory. I think a rather difficult, cha challenging one, and, and uh, it has not, been, has not been unraveled in any satisfactory way. Well, this was a phenomenon that you can analyze at zero temperature, at positive temperature, there are these results on quantum Brownian motion that we already heard about. I want to look at the problem in the, uh, in the mean field limit where it becomes a, Hamilt a problem in Hamiltonian dynamics. And I have repeated the equations of motion of the particle and the wave field that I just went through uh, five minutes ago. And the the problem in front of our eyes is to solve these equations and understand how the solutions behave. Now, as a, an old physicist, I will not immediately attack the general problem. I will look for special solutions. And then I can hope that once I have understood sufficiently many special solutions, I might find a sort of general insight into the qualitative behavior of general solutions. So what are these special solutions? Let's look at solutions where the atom uh, propagates ballistically, inertially. So we call these traveling wave solutions. There is no external force acting on the particle. It travels ballistically through the Bose gas. So we make an ansatz that the momentum of the atom is constant, its position grows linearly in time, 
xt is vt plus x naught, v is the initial speed, and the state functional of the Bose gas is described by a, a wave field gamma sub v at the argument x minus vt minus x naught. That's the ansatz. We plug this ansatz into our equations of motion and find that the equation for gamma v goes like minus iv dot gradient applied to gamma v, and then on the right hand side we have minus Laplacian over little m is the, the mass of an atom in the Bose gas, minus Laplacian over 2m applied to gamma v, plus a term linear in the real part of gamma v that depends on the two body interaction potential in the Bose gas which is denoted by capital phi, and little kappa is a coupling constant. Now, if you look at this, this equation, it's simple to analyze. You can just do it by Fourier transformation, and you find that as long as v, the speed, the initial speed of the particle, is smaller than the square root kappa phi hat, uh, etc., this is the speed of... Uh, of sound in the Bose gas, so as long as the initial speed of the particle is bounded by the speed above by the speed of sound in the Bose gas, this equation for the wave field gamma v has a nice regular solution. And then by plugging this solution into the equations of motion for the particle, you find that in fact, indeed, the particle propagates a constant speed through the Bose gas. So we have found a special solution to summarize the contents of this special solution. Uh, if you walk through an interacting environment, you will not slow down if your speed is well below the speed of sound of the environment. So when you do your jogging, try not to go supersonic, because then you're going to be slowed down. All right. So if V is larger than the speed of sound in the Bose gas, you can still look at the sunsets, but you find out that the wave field gamma V becomes very singular. If you then plug it back into the equation of motion for the particle, you find that P dot T is non-zero. So you, in fact, you find a non-zero friction force. The form of this fr friction force is as you would expect it if you know about Fermi's golden rule. This is really just a fer Fermi golden rule type force that describes the friction. So the contents then is that you will slow down if you try to run faster than the speed of sound of your environment. In fact, if the environment consists of an ideal Bose gas, non-interacting Bose gas, you will keep slowing down until you com come to a complete rest. And this is a phenomenon that I want to discuss in a little more detail, but I guess I don't have much time anymore. So force traveling waves, if you apply an exter a constant external force to the particle, then in fact you do get supersonic motions you get two types of solutions, a stable and an unstable solution. And the state, the wave field in the Bose gas looks a little like one of these Mach cones. All right. And so what I would li now like to discuss is a result that shows that the particle that starts its motion at the supersonic speed gets, uh, experiences friction until its speed drops to a value at or below the speed of sound. And well, there is a shock, you know, he, uh, something, this looks a little like a shock, I suppose. Yes. Okay, so this is a nice, uh, I think a nice result. I, in fact, it is one of the, you know, it's a pretty subtle and complicated result. And Without Gang Zhou, this would never have been completed. He is a very good expert in nonlinear PDEs. And so this is what comes into the game here. But I think I have to leave this to questions. We have, a the we have two theorems. If the Bose gas is an ideal gas, so the dispersion law is non-relativistic, the friction mechanism works until the particle has complete, 
has come to complete rest. And that is what I have prepared here on these transparencies. There is a more recent result. In fact, the result, uh, the paper is not totally finished, but uh, almost. It says the following. If you describe an interacting Bose gas in the Bogle-Yuboff limit, where the Hamiltonian becomes quadratic, but the speed of sound is positive, then a supersonic particle experiences friction until its velocity has approached the, the speed of sound or below. This is, uh, unfortunately, I mean, we have the present size of the paper is 50 pages. It's, it's a little bit complicated. I certainly cannot explain to you how the proof goes in the last 30 seconds. So I think maybe it's a good moment to stop at this point. And I want to thank you for your attention.